Top Bird Talk. It's my absolute pleasure to chair this session. Really interesting looking at different patient cohorts. Our first speaker is Heather Gill. She's going to talk about prehabilitation and aneurysm surgery. She's an assistant professor and vascular and endovascular surgeon. She works with our godfather and it says it on his t-shirt of prehabilitation at McGill. Thank you, Heather. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, we're going to get started for the first talk of the day. So I'm going to be talking about prehabilitation in aortic surgery. I have no financial disclosures. Um, I would like to give a shout out to my PhD student, Miguel Coca Martinez. So we're going to start by talking about the current literature for prehabilitation in aortic surgery. Um, there are seven RCTs on all aneurysm patients and four RCTs on sort of perioperative, preoperative aneurysm patients. With that, we've done more than four systematic reviews. So we have almost more systematic reviews than we do RCTs. Bit of a problem, but we'll go from there. So the first uh, systematic review I want to talk about is uh, this one because it talks about the safety of doing exercise training in patients with abdominal aortic aneurysm, which was always a big fear with these patients was whether or not it was actually safe to exercise them. So their primary outcome was safety and exercise capacity. They looked at seven studies uh, with 489 patients. Now, this was all aneurysms, so anything over three centimeters. And they basically found a cardiovascular event rate of 0.8%. No growth of the aneurysm, although that was in aneurysms that were less than five and a half centimeters, and an increase in peak VO2 and anaerobic threshold. So their conclusions were that it is safe, you're not going to grow your aneurysm, and they had very low cardiac event rates. This is the big one, the Cochrane Review. This is for patients that were scheduled for surgery, so in the perioperative prehabilitation, we'll call it. There's four RCTs, which range from inspiratory muscle training to full circuit training. It's exercise only in all of the studies, not multimodal. And they all included both endovascular and open aneurysm repair. So for those of you that are not vascular surgeons, endovascular aneurysm repair is a very different surgery from open aneurysm repair, very, very different surgical insults. So it's collection of data. And the big thing is that the certainty for evidence for each outcome was low to very low. <laughs> with a high risk of bias. So they're uncertain if prehab decreases 30-day mortality, pulmonary complications, need for reintervention or bleeding, and it might slightly decrease cardiac complications and renal complications. Not the strongest summary that we're looking for in a conference where, you know, prehab is fantastic. So basically, we need more evidence. So that's about it. That's the sum of evidence in currently in prehabilitation for aortic surgery. We're a little bit behind the cancer trials. So the trials that are currently underway, the only other one I could find currently actively recruiting is the EBPOP aorta. And this is, they're doing a pilot prospective trial in Toulouse, France, looking at functional recovery after open aneurysm surgery. So they're doing an outpatient prehabilitation program versus control, looking at the HUDAS score right after surgery and at three months after surgery. And then I'm here to talk about the prehab study, which is a multinational trial that we're starting up on multimodal prehabilitation in patients undergoing open aneurysm surgery, because that is one of the largest surgeries that we do, that's for sure. So we have six participating centers. It's an international trial. We have two in Canada, three in the UK, and one in Spain. It's sponsored by a CIHR, which is the Canadian Institute of Health Research Grant. The objectives, there's a lot of them, so just bear with me. The primary objective is to assess the impact of multimodal prehabilitation on postoperative complications following open aneurysm repair. We also want to assess the impact on hospital and ICU length of stay, readmissions, emergency room visits, reinterventions, and 90-day mortality. We want to assess the effect on quality of life and functional capacity. We're planning to assess the acceptability, safety, and adherence, as well as fidelity of the intervention. Um, we want to, as in, then we're going to assess the cost effectiveness, because I think that's essential in every study. And then we also want to assess the role of gender and sex on multimodal prehabilitation, adherence, participation, and retention. So a lot of objectives with this study. <laughs> Hopefully we can live up to all of them. So it's a multi-center RCT. Um, with multimodal prehab versus standard of care in patients awaiting open aneurysm. The plan is to recruit 152 patients with 76 per group. 
The interim analysis will be done with 40 patients in each group. Uh, we will be randomizing and stratifying based on center and sex. There are uh, There's quite a bit of evidence that in open aneurysm repair, there's big differences between sexes in terms of outcome. So that's why we do have to stratify according to sex. Our inclusion criteria is elective open aneurysm repair patients with a diameter of less than seven centimeters, uh, over 50 years old and ability to give consent. Our exclusion is going to be anyone going undergoing any other kind of aneurysm repair, so thoracic, thoracoabdominal, periviscerol, and patients with ruptured or symptomatic aneurysms. More than seven centimeters, that's felt to be unsafe to wait to repair that and to exercise them, and then any contraindication to exercise. So our primary outcome is going to be the comprehensive complication index. We saw that in some of the other trials yesterday. People have talked about it. Um, it's a linear interval score from 0 to 100 that incorporates all complications from uh, surgery. Most of you know about this already, so I'm not going to go into too much depth. Uh, a lot of aneurysm trials like to look at composite outcomes, so cardiac, renal, resp complications. It's not the most precise. So this should give us a better idea of burden of complications on patients. So our secondary outcomes, it looks like a lot here, but there's healthcare-related outcomes. So that's what I talked about for complications, length of stay, mortality, readmission, et cetera. Functional capacity and physical activity outcomes. We will be doing a six-minute walk test. We will be doing CPET uh, to look at VO2 max and, and anaerobic threshold, and we will be doing the Y-PASS questionnaire. Patient reported outcomes will be having quality of life with the SF36 and the HADS questionnaire. Nutritional status, because we have Chelsea as our nutritionist, uh, we'll be looking at the PGSGA and body composition outcomes. And then we have a lot of study-related uh, interventions like compliance, fidelity, adverse events, program satisfaction, and cost effectiveness. So this is a complicated slide. It's a little busy, but the patients see the vascular surgeon and they get sent for the trial once it's decided that they're going to be, or the plan is for them to have surgery. Um, they will have a baseline assessment where they undergo all of the, the overall testing. Then they get entered into either standard of care or our multimodal program where we will be checking compliance fidelity throughout the course of the program. They then get assessed again. They have surgery and then they'll be assessed at six weeks and one year. Um, so our exercise component um, they will be assessed by a mobility and uh, assessed by an exercise specialist who will assess their mobility and their capacity to undertake exercise. The plan is supervised endurance exercise twice a week via HIT, same as most of the protocols that you guys have been talking about over the last 24 hours, uh, both HIT training and strength training. Um, and then home based exercise is promotion of physical activity, where they plan to do at least one day a week of low intensity strength training and one day a week of low to moderate aerobic exercise. Um, because of their aneurysm patients, and even though we've proven it's safe, there is still a little bit of fear of doing HIIT training. That's We'll only be doing the HIIT training supervised and low moderate aerobic exercise at home. And then inspiratory muscle training five times a week for 10 minutes. So this is a more intense look at what our exercise plan is. We will be planning workload reduction if their blood pressure reaches more than 180. So otherwise, it's pretty similar to a lot of other programs. One of our things is to look at how many patients were actually able, are going to be able to do HIT training in one of the other trials by Professor Danju. It, not everybody was able to, to manage the HIT training because their blood pressure would get too high. So that's one of our uh, compliance and fidelity questions. Strength training, 20 minutes, upper body and lower body exercises. The big thing in this is going to be to be avoiding Valsalva maneuvers, and we can get into this more if, if people have more questions about it. The home-based promotion of physical activity is really, as we talked about, low-moderate intensity, either walking or cycling at least once a week, and resistance training at least once a week with inspiratory muscle training. Our nutritional intervention is a nutritional assessment, uh, so they're going to have a PGSGA anthropomorphics, body composition, and a three-day food diary. Uh, they then will see the dietitian <laughs> and uh, be given education on a balanced intake, weight management, regulation of blood glucose. They'll be given adequate protein intake with whey supplementation after every supervised exercise training program. 
or session, I should say, as well as vitamin D and other nutritional supplements, PRN, according to the dietitian. So the psychosocial sphere, um, we are actually focusing on um, more the psychological support. So every patient will see the have a psychological intervention of one hour to begin with, where active participation of the patient in the healing process is going to be promoted, promotional interviewing, where they discuss mindfulness, deep breathing strategies, relaxation strategies, as well as assess the patient's anxieties and coping strategies. Patients will be offered a second visit if they want, and patients that score highly on or low on the HADS questionnaire will be, if necessary, referred to a psychologist. So the control group will be given standard of care according to each center's standard of practice, hence why we're going to be stratifying based on center, because every center has slightly different standard of care for aneurysm repairs. However, all patients will be offered smoking cessation and anemia correction in both arms. We have IRB approval at the main site. The satellite sites are undergoing approval at this point. Recruitment should be starting at the main site in the next couple of months and for all sites, hopefully in the fall. Plan for three-year recruitment and a four-year overall study so that we have a year outcome on everybody. So sorry it's not actual data, but it's hopefully a plan to get you some real data so that we can then say whether or not we can force them into prehab (laughs) based on yesterday's discussion. Thank you very much. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe. Check us out on YouTube. And of course, on social media, we're on Instagram, Facebook and X. Also, it's important to remember that Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EPOM, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about that. And the way to do that is epom.org. Check out our website and find out about some of the incredible conferences we're going to be arranging across the year. edpom.org. <laughs>